Yo, this is the DMZ America podcast. <laughs> Section Yo. three for July 20th. I'm Ted Rawl coming to you from the left. For some Scott's for center clip, not even for, for center, center clip. clip. Not no, I'm not even saying that for D just for me. <laughs> I'm Scott Stas coming to you from the right for the DMZ America podcast here. It's July 20th, 2023, the anniversary of men walking on the moon. Which was impressive, I guess, at the time, if we cared about that thing. What? Shut up. Don't you <laughs> don't even shut up. No, that was the most awesome thing. The Saturn V rocket is the most beautiful thing human beings have ever built. And I mean that including the Eiffel Tower, the right now I'd say my air conditioner pyramids. is the best is the most beautiful. Well, I, I didn't say best, I said the most beautiful. Mm -hmm. It is when you drive up to Huntsville, which is about an hour and a half drive from us, um, they have one that's dilapidated now, but it's they have one at the Welcome Center. They have two at the Space Center um, and one upright and one on its side. It's Ted, this thing was a marvel. It was amazing. And they did it with 1960s technology. I mean, uh, anyway, OK, so happy anniversary. Buzz Aldrin, still the last surviving member of the Apollo 11 crew. I, I'm all about Leica. I think it's, he was the true hero of the space program. Yeah, poor Leica. Leica, they just sort of, I, what, I mean, how Russian is that? We're going, we are going to shoot the dog into space. First animal up there. And, oh, really? That's great. That's a, what an accomplishment. And so how do you get him back? We don't. No, it's like, <laughs> no, it's like, like we said, we shoot dog into space. <laughs> <laughs> we did not say we shoot dog out back out, out of space back here so. now i'm not sure if Leica died from i don't think it was i think it was from cold first because well, there, there are worse ways to die than dying of cold so okay well sure anyway i i you don't know that Leica died Leica could still <laughs> oh, God. Can you verify that he died? Do you know that he died? It's like Democrats defending Biden. Do you know that he has dementia? Can you prove he has dementia? Are you a doctor? So how do you know Leica is dead? Leica could Leica could just be like, roof, roof. I he could when he could show up, he could like scratch at the door of the International Space Station. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Oh, yeah. you're, you're there doing your little experiment on bean growing beans or whatever the hell they do up there, and just all you hear. He's like, oh my god, I want, I want some of that like dog astronaut kibble. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, happy anniversary to men walking on the moon. Yay, us. Um, so uh so, Walmart. Walmart and other places now. Walmart. So basically, uh, yeah, so people who suffer from autism spectrum disorder, uh, many of them are easily uh disturbed by loud noises and um other forms of stimulus. So uh, what is going on is that Walmart is now offering hours in July and August, Saturday mornings, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. in most stores, uh, which they are calling sensory friendly hours for people uh, either with autism or with other neurodivergent conditions. And so basically this is allowing them to go in and not have as many annoying things happen. They said that they turn the, they uh, they also, oh, AMC is doing this, the theater chain. How does they're, that work? They are turning the lights up and the sound down so you can feel free to be you at these. What does that mean? I don't know. I guess the lights, um, I guess the darkness bothers them and um, the loud sounds bother them. Chuck E. Cheese has dimmed lighting a, and uh, a quieter environment. So one of the reduced noise seems to be one of the big things and like more sort of middle range lighting. I guess in, a, in the movies, if, you, if the lights are down all the way, but then you're watching the movie, that contrast would be disturbing. And I gotta say, I mean, to my knowledge, I'm not uh, on, the, on the spectrum, you never know, but the, I have taken one of those tests for uh, HSP, highly highly sensitive person. You can go online and take this test. And I've always suspected that I might be a little more sensitive than most to crowds and uh, loud noises 
And this is, I'm saying this as a former punk rocker. I was going to say. And, yeah. um, but Mosh pits. Me, punk rock is not noise. To me, that is beautiful, beautiful sound. Um, but when I'm irritated, like stuff, like for example, that stupid fucking Frankie goes to Hollywood song, relax, don't do it. I hated that song with a passion. I hated the Pet Shop Boys. Whenever I would hear them in the 80s, if I if I was like in a bar where they started playing that, I would really have to step outside until it was over. And it wasn't because I was trying to make a stand for like the Ramones. It was just because I just really couldn't stand it. Um, there were many times when I would go to a party and have a good time. I would be having a good time, but the music would drive me out. Um, God, what's the techno? Oh my God, techno music? It makes me just want to die. Um, really? With, with hip hop, there was a period when hip hop was extremely dissonant. Exactly. Oh, God. Even if a car drives by playing that shit, it drives me nuts. Um, and it, I find it startling and incredibly irritating. If someone has an irritating voice, it bugs the shit out of me more. And I can tell other people aren't as bothered as I am. Um, if it's hot, I'm fucking dying. Um, so you could just say I'm a big wuss, which is probably just another way of saying that. But I was just like thinking like, okay, well, I don't, I'm not on the spectrum here, but this might be something I would enjoy. Um, just going to really? See, places I, okay. that are like a little more chill. Like and this I, is where you and I are going to have a discussion right now, boy. Um, because I was talking to this with, with my wife, Janine, the other day, and you know, I'm not an asshole generally. I am, you know, in specific areas, but generally, I don't think I'm. A, I'm a, I like to think of myself as fairly empathetic and fairly nice. Oh, you're very, very, very empathetic and very warm. But how? In the, I mean, have we gone over the top on mental illness in this country now for years? Don't forget. I mean, for years, I grew up and Ted less so, but still lived in an environment in America where you know, rub dirt on it and just get get up and you know pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just keep moving forward. Well, there was something to be said for that. I mean, there was some mental damage and some mental baggage that came along with that that we're all dealing with, and I know I am. But Ted, it just seems like this is going to be too much. Everybody has something. Do you know anybody who has nothing who says, yeah, mentally, I'm I'm pretty healthy. I really don't have, no, there's nothing wrong. Do you know anyone who says that today? Yeah, it reminds me of a, the classic Jennifer Berman cartoon uh which has a uh giant a row of empty seats and like two people sitting in this giant stadium that's all full of seats and it's like annual convention children of uh children of normal parents or something like that <laughs> um and i i mean I, I take your point um but i think Look, I, I don't know. It is certainly possible to roll snowflake style and to uh, and to tell people that they, you know, the, and to stop telling people that they should they need to adjust to reality. But at the same time, I mean, our society really is set up in many ways, intentionally or or just passively, to really screw with people's, um, you know, a sensory perception. I, I was reading in a or I, maybe I didn't read it myself. I read that it is true that in um, trade magazines that are for bar owners, um, they are advised to make the environment as stressful as possible. Um, and what they do in bars is they turn like, so for example, instead of having uh, walls and carpeting uh, that are that absorb sound, they make it echoey as possible. Restaurants do this as well. If you ever notice, you go into restaurants, you can barely hear the person you're with. Yeah, Everybody yeah. Like shouting to be heard. That's not a bug. That's a feature. Um, and they're told, restaurateurs are told to do this. They're trained to do this when they go to like a culinary institute to make it echoey and vibrant and loud. And because people are under stress under those conditions, they order more drinks. And that's that your profit right? center. Because basically they're numb, they're they're self medicating. I was a friend of like a, a an acquaintance, but I was a regular on WGN Radio in Chicago. And the, uh, my friend Patty, or she was also on Center Clip. Ted knows her; he's been a guest on her show as well. When she was at WGN, she had a friend who owned a restaurant, and we went there on Sunday when it was closed, and we we're just hanging out. 
And I was saying this, I said, why do you play the music so loud? Why do you have music at all? It says, oh, it adds to the ambiance. I go, no, especially I'm not hard of hearing. I don't have hearing issues yet, knock wood. But, uh, you know, it's still very difficult to hear, especially when they turn the volume up. And she said, well, let me try this. And like I said, her, we were eating, we were, she'd made some kind of food and we were noshing away. She says, let me turn off the music. She went in the back and turned off the music. She goes, oh yeah, so you like this? I go, oh, this is great. Yeah. I can hear everybody at the table. They can hear me. We went out, Milt Rosenberg is a legendary broadcaster. He's passed away, but he, at the time, he was probably the smartest. No offense, Ted, I love you. You know this, I respect you, but Phil, uh, Milt was probably the smartest person I've ever met. Mm -hmm. So he actually had time, made time out of his schedule to have dinner with, with his wife and, and Janine and I. We were at this restaurant. We sit down. It's one of the hottest new restaurants in Chicago. And you hear, <laughs> and we can't, and he, he was 90 at the time. He, he, we couldn't have a conversation. Of course except, not. and the music didn't stop until his wife. I mean, the, all the music. <laughs> and we're talking like this and then for some reason the music just stopped for a split second when his wife blurted out it's all the fault of the jews oh my god <laughs> which she's married to a guy named rose you know um milt rosenberg so you know was she <laughs> was, you i hope i so, let's assume she was joking she was i forgot i can't even remember the issue i just remember the moment oh my god. <laughs> as soon as Check, please she, as soon as she finished saying that, the music kicked in again. I, so I, if, what you say sounds like it could be true. My point is, do we really need sensory friendly days for all these places? Does Walmart really need a sensory two hours, sensory friendly two hours? Is this really a thing? Well, can we just make it, how about making it sensory friendly all the time? Um, just what? have like lighting that's easy on the eyes. Uh, even if you're not neurodivergent, I'm sure you'd appreciate it. Uh, how about like not having insanely loud noise? Uh, I would appreciate it. I'm sure many people would, um, you know, just do it all the time. I mean, what's the big deal with why not just do this all the time? I mean, why do we have to have all these places that are so fucking annoying to be in? I, you know, yeah. And when I go out to dinner, for instance, I mean, if uh, when I go out with friends, I want to be able to hear them. I don't want to hear, you know, some bullshit or music in the background, even if I like it. I mean, it just seems to me preposterous to have it. Now, on the bigger picture, the mental health issue and the mental health issues facing this country, we did go. My parents, for instance, my dad was one of the generation that went to war and saw horrific stuff. And you know how they dealt with it? They didn't. <laughs> Right. And then they, <laughs> they came just, back and like beat their wives and committed suicide and, and children and yeah. dr drank like fish or got hooked on drugs. Yeah. I mean, hooked on alcohol. Did I say fish? That was weird. <laughs> well, you they got hooked on fish, Ted. It's the coelacanth <laughs> making it. Rearing <laughs> they its, were hooked on rearing its cool head. Um, no, my dad would wake up to the day I moved out of the house, was waking up at least once a month screaming. Uh, from horrific, I mean, night terrors like you wouldn't believe. Uh, he was abusive. He was alcoholic and used drugs. He did sober up and later in his life, which was a blessing to everybody. But that generation dealt with that. That was bullshit too. But I'm kind of thinking, Ted, have we moved into new bullshit waters that are like, we're just, everyone has something and, um, you know, everyone can be triggered by something and we need, uh, sensory friendly days everywhere. It just seems to me like at a movie theater. This makes no sense. Ted, the movies that are shown today are all action movies, right? They're no longer soft, quiet French extra <laughs> French films. Yeah. I I know that you are thinking this, but life is miserable and then you die. <laughs> you know, we don't have films like that. It's always, oh my God, look at the spaceship. <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> Ted, I am your friend. <laughs> Um, it's all like that. And so I'm sorry, if you don't like loud noises, you can't go to an American movie now. You simply right. cannot go. Yeah. Mean, and so, and con concerts, uh, you know, anything other than classical or something are just impossible. Well, I was going to ask you, you were a punk rocker. Can you go to a punk show now? 
Does um, it, does it, I, can, yeah, but I have to, I have to be all the way, 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 way in the back. And even then it's too loud, but I would have to, I mean, not that really anyone, you know, look, I mean, I don't go to concerts anymore really. And like, there's no, um, you know, it, it's just not, uh, it's not part of my life. I'm old. I'm almost 60 years old, but, um, if I, if, and when I go, I, 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 ha I have to be in the back away from the speakers. I used to be oh. right up at the front of the stage. I would stage dive, um, you know, uh, all that stuff right by the speakers. And I'd come sometimes come out of it. My ears would ring for a couple of days after. Yeah, no, I've been there. I've totally been there. I was in this, I, we went, we went to, yep. Yeah. Can't hear you. Um, uh, but now, I mean, we have friends here, obviously much younger friends who have children, uh, eight, you know, 10, nine, eight, seven years old who are in therapy. And you're just going, you come from a two parent household. You are, you know, you upper middle class. I'm trying to figure out why you are going to therapy and it just doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. And again, I'm trying not to be a dick here. I'm trying to have some, yeah, you know, there are well, mental health issues. Why? What's that? You can ask people why they're going to therapy. Well, they were having difficulty with school or they were, you know, having difficulty with friends. Like, that's how you, that was life. That's what life is full of difficulty. Life is going to suck people. For those of you not aware of it yet. This is, now we life, can get into the fundamental disagreement. Like life, okay. Life does suck because we live under capitalism. But if, mm. but the point of the point of being left-leaning <laughs> so that we end on conflict zone here is is that like we those of us on the left think it life doesn't have to suck shouldn't suck and we should work all work hard as a society to desuckify as much as possible but life does Conservatives suck. Are like life just sucks live with it i'm like that's yeah dumb. no deal with it suck it up deal with it i'm sorry i mean listen i mean i and mean scream I mentioned... at night when you think of the rockets kill, blowing up your best friend right next to you in the trench no and there are there are ways to deal with these things i was lucky enough i mean i i've written about this and talked about it openly i was i was um you know i w i was raised in an abusive household both physically and, and emotionally i mean it was, and it was very very bad i told ted some of the stories and you've dropped your jaw and you've told me some of your stories same way i went and got some therapy but i didn't want to be like so many of my friends who were in therapy at the time who were in it for fucking years and years and well you're years. not supposed to the so the I, I i don't know if this is still true but for many years the american psychological association the apa used to say that it was considered unethical for a therapist to keep you in with them for more than two years well, when I got, when I finally decided to, you know, take a deep breath, say, I'm going to, I got to fix this problem because it was destroying my life. Uh, I went to, uh, and found a counselor who dealt with adult children of alcoholics, dealt with my specific issues. And I said, listen, I don't want, I, I want to, I'm a dude, you know, I'm a dude. I want to fix this. Right. And he was great. And to this day, I can't remember his name, Ted. And it breaks my heart because I really owe him. You didn't fix your memory dead. problems. He didn't fix those. So, but he did. I mean, his dad was such a raging alcoholic that his dad literally bought a bar so he could buy booze wholesale. Well, I mean, I, I admire his ingenuity. <laughs> you have to, yes, there's, there's a problem and he found a solution. That's um, right. The first step so, is, the first step is admitting that you love your problem. <laughs> so, so yes, counseling helped me a great deal. It saved my life. Uh, uh, not to put too fine, I really literally did. But by turns, you know, I got that, got the help, got knew that it was going to be a difficult road, knew that this was going to be a struggle for the rest of my life. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, we were just talking about going to a to an event you and I earlier, just before we started recording, and I'm like, going, they all, you know, why would they like me? I'm a piece of garbage. You know, that's the that still plays in my head. That's still something I have to deal with. But I don't want a special day at the mall for me. I really don't. I just think well, I personally want every day to be my special day at the mall. And I want every day to be your special day. At the mall. <laughs> but it can't be. And that's where we're different. And you're right. As a conservative, it's like, you know, you have a problem, fix it. Um, and, as granted, a, and as a lefty, I say it's if we have a problem that affects a lot of pe a substantial number of people, not like two or three people out of 300 million. Um, 
even for them. I mean, if we can, but I'm just saying like, when you have a problem that's afflicting millions of people, let's roll up our sleeves and work on it. You know, we're all in a relationship together in, as a country, 330 million citizens of the US, 7 billion citizens of earth. Let's like figure out how to help each other out with our respective well, problems. Why, why do we have to say like, oh, you know, the bar has to be loud. The restaurant has to be loud just because the fucking owner wants to sell more fucking drinks. Like, no, not at all. That's ridiculous. Well, I would never force anybody to, to s subscribe to the sensory friendly agenda. If you, which makes it sound like it's a conspiracy. It's not. But I would never. I would. I'd like, say. I, I think there. I know. I know you would. There can be laws. Hate. I mean, look, Scott. Here in the. I mean, noise really does have a tremendous impact on people. Uh, here in New York, there's a a number of subways that are elevated, um, and as there are obviously in Chicago, and but in New York, they're notoriously loud. I used to live next to one, and it's there was a program. Um, I'd say about 25 years ago to uh, make the, the elevated subways quieter. And they put rubber gaskets along the tracks so that when, it used to be like when they would turn, it was like this most ungodly screech. So I, I remember reading that it was like 140 decibels, like, like high pitched squeal. Yeah, anyway, okay. So they did that for a variety of reasons. I'm not really sure what motivated them to do it, but they did it. And then the most amazing thing happened. All the reading scores, uh, and math scores in, at the high schools and middle schools that were located along the routes of those elevated subways skyrocketed. Suddenly schools that had never sent a kid to college uh, were sending kids to Harvard. I mean, it completely changed this, these kids' ability to get a fucking education because they could fucking hear their teachers and they could hear themselves think in their classrooms. I mean, noise matters. Well, or the gentrification of New York happened and you had richer parents moving in who actually were involved. That in didn't it. happen. These are neighborhoods that are still poor. Mm, okay. Yeah. I mean, elevated subways <laughs> in New York tend to be in shitty areas. No. You mean they treat poor people like shit? I know. Because they bury the subways when they, yeah, they put them underground in in rich areas. And of course, obviously, and the fact that the subway is still elevated makes it less desirable in general, of course. Really? Because I mean, uh, it's, it's loud all... and like, and it's dark. Like the areas under subways are like skanky and dank. And like, there's always like, yeah. weird, like subway juice dripping down on you from up on high. Actually, in Chicago, it's a lot of because you have access. If you if you have easy access to the L, then that actually raises your property values. And I was when I first moved to Chicago, I was invited to one of the guys who does the jumble in his house, and we're there in these lovely little brownstones, uh, and we're in the backyard talking. And I'm talking to his wife. I said, "So, how long have you lived here?" She says, "Well, we've been here about," and she froze. And then all of a sudden, you're i didn't notice that the track went literally through their backyard yeah and her conversation her, her sentence would stop mid-sentence and then as soon as it's done yep so about it. three and a half years um we really like it She's oh awesome. my god oh my god so but okay and we're going to disagree on this one because I really think that we have gone um, mental illness nuts in this country and that it's it's typical for the United States. We never go halfway. We never just go like, OK, well, well, we've been ignoring this issue. Let's you know go here and start facilitating and, and admitting that people have issues, you know, and that we need to address them. And that, for instance, the healthcare system has to pay for these, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so. But I'm sorry, we've just, I, it just feels like we've gone too far in the other direction. And we need to write that ship, it seems to me. But I agree. I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, I do think moderation in all things is tends, well, not in all things. I mean, we do need to abolish capitalism and uh, greenhouse gases. But in many things, moderation is a good thing. And I agree that we could do better. But anyway, uh, we will leave that there and we'll, resume this discussion <laughs> or one 
not unlike it next week. Um, <laughs> thanks everyone for listening. Scott, where can everyone find all things Scott Standis while they're awaiting the next thrilling edition of the DMZ America <laughs> podcast? Well, let, let me tease the next edition is we're going to be talking AI. We're going to bring in some guests that uh, actually deal with this stuff. And so is it a threat? Well, <laughs> just to just to uh, well, let you know, uh, a little we, secret. You won't even know necessarily if we will actually be hosting because maybe AI will be hosting the DMZ that America some, podcast. That's that's right, Ted. We think that that could never happen. Um, okay, <laughs> see things, all things, Scott. Go to gocomics.com slash Scott Stantis, one word. Go to gocomics.com slash prickly city. You can see my comic strip. You can go to the Chicago Tribune.com and go to the opinion section, see a gallery of work I do for them. And you can go to Center Clip, which is this wonderful site. You can go to the website, you can also get the app. You can hear Ted, you can hear me, you can hear some of our other friends. It's like mini podcasts and it's really fun. Ted and I, Ted started the show by saying we're center clip. <laughs> yes, it really I, is. It's an easy thing to use. It's an easy thing. It's a great thing to listen to. It's 30 seconds to maximum five minute long video audio, you know, podcast effectively like mini podcasts. So give it a listen. Center clip micro podcast. Um, so Ted, where can we see th all things Ted? You can go to my website, raw.com who, what, why.org on Saturdays. Sputnik news on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And you can check out my radio show co-hosting Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon Eastern time on uh, Sputnik radio. You can best place to find it is probably rumble. They also have uh, an archive of the old ones in case you don't want to listen live. Scott is a frequent guest on the, uh, on the, on the show, which is called the final countdown. So there you have it. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll catch you next week. Try to stay cool. Peace.